Brothers and sisters, we've been following along with the church calendar for the last little while. Um, this is sometimes called the lectionary. Uh, we have been following along and we've been looking largely at New Testament passages, but today we are going to look at the Old Testament, specifically the story of David and Goliath. Now, uh, it's maybe been a long time since you heard the story of David and Goliath, but it is good to read it in this time and in this place because not only, well, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, we are reading from, we are reading from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, David and Goliath, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Sokoth in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes and Dam Ephes Damon between Sokoth and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley in between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span, and that is about nine feet nine inches, or about three meters, just so you know. Nine feet nine. He would make a good, uh, a, a good basketball player, perhaps. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels, which is about 125 pounds. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistines said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Eliab, the, the second Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand now Jesse said to his son David, Take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up and set out, as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines, facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking to them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? 
He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him this is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here, and with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. What have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the man answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear come and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord, who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield-bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. 
When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sharayim road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. David brought the Philistines' head and took it to Jerusalem. He put the Philistines' weapon in his own tent. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it's been a long time since I looked at that story, but it is appropriate in timing, uh, maybe particularly for me, but also, I hope, Lord willing, for you. There is always a danger in over-spiritualizing certain passages in Scripture, for uh, taking the, the story of Goliath, for example, and, and just interpreting it as a metaphor for our spiritual troubles. This is a real story with real characters who really lived in a historical context. But it is also true that this story does have deep spiritual meaning for us, just as it did for the people of Israel. There is a reason why Samuel recorded this story, and it is not simply because it is a fantastic, amazing story, but it's also because it taught the people of Israel something very important or at least it would have if they had listened. Now, we have to be careful, though, about what it teaches and what it does not teach. You see, in this, if we just look at this passage, it could be tempting to think that with one strike of one stone, God wiped out the Philistines and they were never trouble again. But that is simply not true. The Philistines continued to be a thorn in the flesh long after uh, Goliath was killed. And so it is with the battles that Israel fought in other ways, too. Just because they won a battle here or a battle there or even many battles, it didn't mean that their battles were over, that the fight was over, and that they would never have to fight again. And so, too, it is with our battles. I don't think that we are facing, probably not, we are not facing any giants who are nine feet nine and carrying a 125 pound bronze shield, but we are facing our own battles, each and every one of us. And sometimes it is so tiring and so hard whether your battles are against temptation, whether your battles are against people who would do you wrong, whether your battles are against the powers and principalities of this world, like Paul said, those are the real enemies that we face. Satan, who is behind those things, whatever your battles are, we have to fight them, it seems, day in and day out. And sometimes it feels like there is never a break. In fact, in this story, we see that there are at least two battles that David faces. And there is a third one that comes out very quickly after this story even in spite of the triumph that God gave to David. The, the first battle that David faces is, is the, the hate and the anger of his oldest brother Eliab, right? He comes in to bring bread and cheese and stuff like this to help his brothers, and his brother con accuses him of being conceited and wicked, <laughs> 
Maybe he was afraid of David stealing his glory, or, or maybe David was just too handsome. He was handsome and ruddy. Or, or maybe David had been irresponsible in the past. Who knows? Regardless, David faces that battle first. And he says, oh man, can I even talk? Can I even talk about these things? And then that battle is over and he faces the battle of Saul giving him the, 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 all of his armor and so on and realizing that that is not going to work. And then he faces the battle with Goliath who, who casts all kinds of insults and curses at him. And then he faces the battle of Goliath with the actual sword and the actual sling and the stones. And then shortly after this, he faces another battle of Saul being jealous of him. And so just because, just because God gives David a spectacular victory, it does not mean that the war is over. But sometimes it is also true that we do not use the weapons that God has given us appropriately. Brothers and sisters, I was reminded a number of times this week that the word of the Lord is, is sharper than any double-edged sword that it can, it can cut through our enemies. And sometimes, as I was reminded, we need to declare aloud that Satan has lost the battle, the war against God, that Jesus has won that battle, and that Satan has no right to accuse us any longer. Now, someday that will come to pass in a way that is super concrete when Christ returns and, and Satan is thrown into the pit and, and everything is made new. But that day is not quite yet. In the meantime, we have battles to fight. We have battles to fight. And that fighting can be tiring. And Samuel knew that. Samuel knew that the people of Israel would need the story of David and Goliath to encourage them in the dark times, to remind them of the power of God, to remind them that they are not weak and alone, though it may seem that way, to them and to the rest of the world, but rather God fights on their side. So what are the battles that you are facing? Are you tired? Are you in a dark place? Do you feel alone and weak? Are you terrified of the giants in your life? What are your giants? Are your giants the words that you say to yourself that are lies really from Satan? Are your giants the adversity that you face in your life? Are your giants a marriage that is crumbling around you? Are your giants children who are not going the way of the Lord? Are your giants grandchildren who have strayed from the gospel? Are your giants fear? What are your giants? The battle, 
brothers and sisters, is not ours. It is the Lord's. Another person in our church reminded me this morning, uh, this is Friday when I'm recording this, Another person in our church reminded me this morning of this passage from Revelations chapter 12, verses 10 to 12, in which we read this. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shirk from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. Brothers and sisters, we live in this world where the devil has been hurled down, and he is full of fury, and woe to us on that score. But on the, at the same time, O oh, great joy and glory, for we have triumphed by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Brothers and sisters, be encouraged. Whether you face real giants with bronze shields or whether you face the inner giants, or whether you face family giants, or foe giants, or fear giants, be encouraged, for we have the victory. We can face the battles of today. We can face the battles of tomorrow. We can face the battles of whatever years there are to come. And we can be renewed in our strength. Because God gives us the victory. Let us pray. Father in heaven. Thank you that yours is a victory. That in this battle of David and Goliath, it was really the battle of God and Goliath. And we know who wins that battle. And that so too, whenever the people of Israel were facing battle, if they had just relied on you, they could find in you the victory and when they did not, they suffered losses. Lord, please help us to recognize that all the battles are yours. That all the victories are yours. Help us, O oh God, not to grow weary in fight, fighting the battles. But strengthen us, O oh God. Lord, help us. You are the victor. You are the champion. You are the Savior. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.